Welcome back to session two of our faith group series, God's Promise, Abraham's Faith. I'm Pastor Dave, and I'm excited to be diving into the life of Abraham with you. It's possibly one of the more interesting and important narratives in the entire Old Testament. So we pray that these sessions are a blessing for you and for your faith groups. Well, in session one with Pastor Scott, you looked at Abraham's call from Genesis chapter 12. Isn't that a fascinating episode? God comes to a 75-year-old man and says, go. Imagine starting your life's major work at age 75. It just goes to show you're never too old or too young to be used by the Lord. So you better be ready. Well, Genesis provides very little insight into what was going on in the heart and mind of Abraham, or Abram as he is still known here. Instead, in verse 4, it simply says, So Abram went, as the Lord had told him. It reminds me of Jesus' call to the fishermen when they simply dropped their nets and left everything, even their father, to follow him. This is just crazy obedience on Abram's part. No dragging his feet, no arguing over details, no questioning, no doubting, no reluctance. He just went. No wonder why Abraham, Abraham is known for his faith. But then Abram gets a glimpse of the promise. Abram arrives in the promised land, the land of Canaan, Though it's full of Canaanites, the Lord tells Abram, I'm giving you, I'm giving this land to your offspring. So Abram builds an altar and offers prayer. Abram wanders around some more to the hill country, to the east of Bethel. He settles in there, and once again, he builds an altar, and once again, he calls on the name of the Lord. He continues on, and then he gets hungry. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 tells us, Now there was famine in the land. It was the promised land, but it wasn't looking very promising. Can you relate? When the promise is hard to see, does the life of faith become a life of doubt? Sometimes the promise seems to let us down. It's not all that it's cracked up to be. It fails us. It's not supposed to be like this. Lord, why did you let me down? These are cries in the face of disappointment. They come when faith seems to fail, when the promise seems broken. But they come regardless of faith. Oftentimes, issues arise because of two misunderstandings. One, we're too short-sighted. We want the promise, and we want it now, right? In our culture of immediate gratification, we aren't used to waiting for results. But God often is slow. His timing is perfect, but his timing can be slow. And second, we have two very different, we have very different ideas of what the promised results should be. We've misunderstood what is promised. We think God has promised us things like health and happiness. We love that quote from Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But we've totally taken it out of context and totally imposed our own ideas of prospering. So then, of course, when the promise doesn't come in our timing or with our results, we blame God. We lose faith and we take matters into our own hands. That's exactly what Abram did. Regardless of the strong faith he showed in the first nine verses of the chapter, Abram moves to plan B and he strikes his tent and he heads to Egypt. I like the way author and preacher Chuck Swindoll puts it. He says, Abram failed his first test 
when he rushed down to Egypt instead of seeking God's counsel. Until the famine, he talked to God and built altars to memorialize his relationship with the Almighty. Once the severe famine struck, however, we hear no more prayers. We see no more altars. Rather than seeking God's instruction, Abram made a beeline for where caravan merchants said he would find food in abundance. Well, following the description of God's glorious promise and Abram's unflinching faith in the beginning of chapter 12, commentator Walter Brueggemann poses two questions. Will this God keep his outlandish promises? And will the sojourning man and woman be able to trust the promise? The two questions are not the same, Brueggemann observes, but they always come together. And thus far into the Egyptian episode, it's fair to wonder about both questions. Well, the second question gets a lot murkier as Abram and Sarai approach Egypt. Abram apparently realized that he married up, you know what I mean? And that his wife, Sarai, is a beautiful woman. And he anticipates that this could cause trouble. I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, he says. Take note, guys, that's always a good way to start a conversation with your wife. Uh, he continues, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, and they will let you live. This is why I constantly fear for my life when I go out with Andrea, by the way. So here's Abram's solution. Say that you're my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life might be spared for your sake. Well, that's awkward. <laughs> to save his skin, Abram passes his wife off as his sister. Now, it should be noted that Abraham is not actually lying here. Sarai is actually Abram's half-sister. But do you think Sarai took it this way? I don't think so. But Abram was right. Sarai was beautiful, not bad for a 65-year-old woman. And she caught the eye of, of all people in Egypt, the Pharaoh, one of the most powerful kings in the world. So Pharaoh takes Sarai into his house and compensates Abram, her brother, with livestock and servants. This is not exactly a pretty picture of women's rights here, is it? Well, Chuck Swindoll observes, while Sarai didn't face immediate risk of being violated, imagine how she felt about her husband here. His no faith response, his cowardice, placed her in danger while he lived the high life. While she dwelled among strangers, subjected to unfamiliar rituals, and facing an unfamiliar future, an uncertain future, Abram hobnobbed with Egypt's elite class. Well, Abram had taken the promise into his own hands. He pursued his own ends here with his own means. Well-known commentator Gerhard von Rad observes that the bearer of the promise is the greatest enemy of the promise here. Martin Luther adds that Abram let the word get out of his sight. And as a result, he even fails to protect his own wife. But the Lord does not. Verse 17 is the only mention of God in this story. It says, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. When Abram fails, the Lord succeeds. Back in the Lord's promise to Abraham in verse 3, he declared, 
I will bless those who bless you, and to him who dishonors you, I will curse. Here, 14 verses later, we see the truth of that promise. Even when the promise bearer is off where he should not be, and behaving as he shouldn't be, Brueggemann, Brueggemann observes that it is dangerous business to deal with Abraham. Something powerful is at work here, more powerful than Abram or the Egyptian empire. People and nations are blessed through Abraham and his offspring, or people are cursed by Abraham and his offspring. Oh, and by the way, through faith, you are Abraham's offspring. How are you a blessing to others? And how are you a curse to others? Maybe don't ask your spouse that one. Well, Pharaoh somehow discovers that these plagues are due to the fact that this woman that he thought to be Abram's sister is actually Abram's wife. Naturally, he is stunned by the news and feels betrayed. But surprisingly, he doesn't deal vengefully with this lying, wandering nomad, but instead he simply says, here is your wife, take her and go. And it says, Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now, did you catch that? Abram was sent packing, but he was sent packing with everything that he had acquired through his dishonesty. All the livestock, the servants, and the wealth given to him on account of his sister. For all of his cowardice and moral failure, Abram still continues to be protected and blessed by God. God who promised, who promised still continues to rescue Abram and even more bless Abram. Will the sojourning man and woman be able to trust the promise? Well, we're going to see that it's going to be a struggle. Abraham and Sarah are, after all, human. And as humans, they are sinners. They'll have moments of amazing trust and then moments of woeful failure. Indeed, Abraham actually tries this same sister trick again in, verse, in chapter 20. But the other question, will this God keep his outlandish promises? Well, we're going to see that this is consistently and steadfastly a yes. A yes and then some. God will keep his promise in spite of Abraham. And God will keep his promises in spite of you. And he'll do it for you. In a sense, it's refreshing, or at least reassuring, for sinners like us to see sinner, a, a sinner like Abram. He's no different than we are. But it is even more refreshing and even more reassuring to see the faithfulness of God. He is true to his promises, no matter how much we are not. Well, I hope this spurs some great discussion for you. God bless you, and we'll see you in church.